Thank you, Dana. That is beautiful. That, that song stirs me every time. Dana also donates the sound system here, without which you wouldn't hear us. <laughs> so thank you, Dana. Could we assemble our staff in front of the stage, please? I just want to make note that when we started these some 19 years ago, uh, there was a lot of help, and it was great. But Susan used to make the lasagna and the cookies and do all the registration and the name tags and every bit of it. Um, and, uh, you know, we couldn't have done it without a lot of help. But now we actually have staff. Come on down. Come on down. Stand in front of the stage. Come on, Amanda. Come on, Gail. Come on, Gary. So, Elisa. Uh, Elisa's busy at the registration table. Well, anyway, these are the people who make work in network. Yes. Cindy and Amanda are the education staff. Elisa, who is busy at the table, and Gail are the sighting network coordinators. Katie and Wendy, who could not be here, are the Whale Center people. Um, and we have Gail, she is not here. She is our program coordinator. So we need a lot of help, but we have a lot of help now. So it's fantastic. Thank you. Thanks for letting me. Yeah, come on volunteers, because really, we couldn't afford all these people, but they help. Without which we couldn't do it. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Somebody has to find the store. Somebody has to greet and inform and educate. Of course, our board, for instance, Fred and Jill and Sandy. Um, and let's see, who else is here? Oh, I'm here. Uh, Dave Anderson is here. Um, Bob Gens is not here. Christy Coro is not here. Jim Lovehorn is not here. But uh, those are our board, just for introduction purposes. Yep. Thank you, Dave. So it is my great joy to, John, um, to uh, give you an update, a couple of updates. Basically, can you make this show come up and that show go away? <laughs> to tell you about... <laughs> <laughs> We're in good shape here. Um, to give you a Toki update, Toki Day, um, because after all, that's why we started this organization 20 some odd years ago, uh, and she is still there. I mean, there really isn't a whole lot of news because she's still there, but the fact that she's still there that's the news every day. It's kind of a miracle. I mean, I'm, I'm just in awe of her all the time because how does she do it? How does she survive? How does she keep her physical and mental health and be able to be energetic? We just got a big scare when they were shut down, doors locked, no information for 10 weeks from the middle of October to the end of December. But then they reopened, and there she was. And a good friend went and took this picture and some videos, and she's doing the breaches, and, and she seems like she's still hale and hearty. 
I don't know how. It'll be 50 years in August that she's been there. 50 years in that confinement. No interaction. Whales are very touchy-feely, but she has no company. No whale company. I really don't see how she does it. Um, we don't know. The owners have just been bought, actually. The corporation, Parcas Rio Unidos, based in Madrid, that owns all the theme parks um, in the U.S. Well, they own Palace Entertainment, which owns a whole bunch of theme parks and marine parks. And they just got bought by a holding company based in Sweden. And we have no idea how to read their minds. I don't know what's going on. Uh, I don't know, there may be some negotiations. The Lummies are basically handling the negotiations uh, as far as you know, how to plan ahead. Um, and to my knowledge, there haven't been any, but I may not know everything. Um, but the ray of hope is that worldwide, the whole dancing whale and dolphin industry is in decline. It's in a serious problem. And I don't have time to go through all of the indications of that, but uh, basically, there are very good signs, including the weekly videos from the Sequarium parking lot that show it's pretty much empty. I mean, it's, they are not getting the revenues. They're giving away tickets to get people to just come through the door. Free passes for the year for people to come in. So they get a few people, but not that many, and that is not revenue. So. Uh, you know, just reading all these tea leaves, they're going to have to negotiate something pretty soon. So, uh, that's about all I can tell you about her, except that she's still looking pretty good. And now I'd like, in fact, I have the privilege of giving you the Snake River Dam update. Uh, because I like easy problems. <laughs> With easy These dams things. have been a raging controversy for actually 75 years. I'm new to this, actually. It's only been in the last three or four years that I've delved into the dams and what they're doing when I found out that the southern residents really do depend on those fish from the Snake River wilderness in central Idaho for their very survival. Um, and you know, we're told that the arguments, oh yes, moving, uh oh, John? Meantime, what I want to say is that we are told that it's a, a battle between the east and west sides of Washington, between the city folk and the country folk. But I'm here to tell you that's really just basic subterfuge or BS. Um, because the arguments are really between those who benefit economically from the annual influx of untold, uncounted hundreds of millions of dollars into the Army Corps of Engineers, the Bonneville Power Authority, and the spin-off of that is subsidized barging up and down the Snake River. And everybody is very used to that, who benefits from it, and they just don't care enough about the salmon and the orcas. And so the battle is between them and those who do care about the last of the biggest runs of salmon, probably in the world, that are flickering out as we speak. So for some historical perspective, just to sort of show you what I'm talking about, in 1945, Congress approved of the, Snake, of the Army Corps of Engineers plan to build some dams, four dams on the Snake River. So in 1947, the Army Corps had to say what they were going to do, and they had to make a report 
on what the effects of that would be. So they wrote a report in 1947, long before the dams were built, which weren't finished until 1975. And they wrote, the problem of passing migratory fish over dams on the Lower Snake River was discussed with representatives of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Washington Department of Fisheries, the Fish Commission of Oregon, Oregon State Game Commission, and the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. This is in the Army Corps report. The consensus of opinion of these agencies was that any series of dams on the Lower Snake River would be hazardous and might entirely eliminate the runs of migratory fish in that stream. And then the Army Corps writes, in the view of the experience at Bonneville Dam, this office does not concur with this unfounded opinion. So they not only reject it, they throw in a little dig while they're at it, just to show some attitude. They just reject it. And that's still where we are today. They still reject those who care about those fish. So two years later, in 1949, the Washington Department of Fisheries wrote a report. And they wrote, and this is signed by the governor and the director of fisheries. Another, there we are, uh, there. Okay, that was the first one. You just heard that. And now the second one, and this is a photocopy of an ancient document. Another serious threat to the Columbia River fishery is the proposed construction by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers of Ice Harbor and three other dams on the Lower Snake River between Pasco, Washington, and Lewiston, Idaho to provide slack water navigation and a relatively minor lack of power. The development would remove part of the cost of waterborne shipping from the shipper and place it on the taxpayer, jeopardizing more than one half of the Columbia River salmon production. So the Snake River historically produced half of the entire Columbia River system salmon in exchange for 148 miles of subsidized barge route. The barging is still subsidized, and the Army Corps still won't bring down the dams. The dams don't generate revenue. They lose money every year, a lot of money. And that's basically where we are today. Even though barge traffic has been in decline, it's 40% down, from the year 2000. And since 1998, 77 orchids have died. That's 22 years. There's only 73 now. Forty-one have been born in that time, but that's a losing proposition. So in March of 2018, almost two years ago, Governor Inslee declared a sort of state of emergency, an executive order to recover the orcas and the Chinook. He directed his agencies to take immediate steps and long-term solutions to recover the salmon and the southern residents. And the order assembled a task force made up of stakeholders, a wide variety of federal agency and state agency people, uh, plus tribal leaders and local governments and other interested stakeholders and a couple of biologists to make recommendations. They had no power, but just to make recommendations. Uh, that was after J28 and J14 died and it was becoming abundantly clear we were losing our southern residents. But the task force didn't put the Snake River dams on the table. They didn't want to talk about it. Until in the middle of 2018 was when J35 had her calf that died at birth and she carried 
that calf around for 17 days and caught the world's attention. And that truly raised the stakes. That got people thinking and that got people calling the governor and saying, we've got to talk about those dams. That needs to be on the table. The task force needs to see how you're going to do it. Um, and they did, but all the conversations were overwhelmed with pro-dam talking points. Well, the one recommendation was to have a stakeholder study. And so that was handed off to some consultant groups and they made their report on December 20th, made it public. And it was designed as a, they said, they said. The idea was not to come to any conclusions, but they interviewed 90 people of what they believed to be the entire array of stakeholders. And they gave everybody's opinions. They said, they said. But when it came to the benefits to salmon and orcas, they were very shallow. They were almost non-existent. They just, they didn't include what we know in this room about orcas and salmon and how they, how the orcas depend on those salmon. For instance, in the last year and a half or so, there have been three major sign-on letters. Uh, August 2018, we are writing as salmon scientists. And I don't have time to quote that exactly. But then, that they recommended. You gotta breach those dams. And then October 15, 2019, we're writing as scientists and researchers with many decades of collective experience and a deep familiarity with the life history and current status of Southern resident orchids. A big sign-on letter by pretty much the whole array of orca researchers. Their thoughts, their opinions didn't get in this report. And then October 22nd, 2019, 55 fisheries and natural resource scientists from about five states, all the surrounding states around the Snake River, wrote another letter. Again, concluding, you got to breach those dams if you want to save the salmon. None of those opinions seem to get in this report. And then Ken Balcom, the whale demographic who had been focused on the southern residents since 1976, uh, said in an interview, biological extinction, lack of reproduction is almost here now. If we go at this rate, we have at most what's left of this reproductive generation. 10 or 12 years and they'll be biologically extinct, unable to reproduce. What the report did include was NOAA Fisheries estimates, which said breaching the dams is not necessary for recovery of Snake River salmon or southern resident orcas. That's a very popular quote with a whole lot of pro-dam people. It's wrong, but NOAA put it out and that's what they use. But the comment period ended yesterday. So I'm gonna say something now that you won't hear me say very often, but the ray of hope combined with what Dana talked about, a lot of people coming out and demanding this, comes from a conservative Republican congressman in Idaho, Mike Simpson. In April of last year, he gave a major, major speech in Boise. And he said some things that are pure heresy. I don't know how he mustered up the courage to even say this, but he is still pretty much standing alone. But he has said it, and he's very influential. 
He said, you got to ask yourself, after spending $16 billion on salmon recovery over the last however many years, is it working? All of Idaho's salmon runs are either threatened or endangered. Look at the number of returning salmon, and the trend line is not going up, it's going down. He cares about salmon. That's his bottom line. That's his main focus. He's from central Idaho, and he cares about those salmon. That's like first and foremost for him. And he is the only... Uh-oh! I'm running out. Okay, I'm almost done. The monkey has flown. That's how I know. Um, okay, moving on down. Um, and he also said, we have excess power we can no longer sell in California because it's not the low-cost power anymore. All these arguments about hydropower, bogus. So do you need to produce power that you cannot sell? And he added, 16 billion in debt. Their ability here is, here is the real power punch right here. I'm telling you, yeah. Uh, their ability to borrow runs out, and Congress has to reauthorize that. And I'm telling you, I don't know if Congress will reauthorize that. That would end it. That would bring those dams down right away. What's sad is that there is not one single elected official in the state of Washington that will say those things, that will join him, that will give him some backup, some cover. That, to me, is... Shameful. Um, and activists are at it. There was a rally Thursday at the state capitol despite the wind and rain. Way to go, you guys. <laughs> Keep it up there. Um, and there was a planned march for the dams, which is to the dams, really, to bring them down. A 23-day trek from Portland to uh, the lower dam to put pressure on the Army Corps, BPA, and Governor Inslee to start breaching the four dams right away. 